Mega Man X is one of the pioneers for active storytelling during a time where platformers had very different narrative standards. The standards being, there weren't any. Within this series is one, wait, wait, hold on, two characters that are the centerpiece of it. But we're going to talk about the actual title character, and how the culmination of unfocused writing, misunderstandings, and different creative minds putting pen to paper has caused our hero to be a neglected character with a messy character arc. Out of sheer curiosity, I went to the Mega Man subreddit to ask a very simple question. Do you like X as a character? Out of the 504 votes, 470 answered yes. I was actually quite surprised how dominating this poll was, but I was comforted by the discussion in the comments. Many people enjoy X for who he is and what he stands for, but will also state that his position in the plot was not always executed well, with the lowest point being Mega Man X7. Quite enough! You need to back off and pay the dues for your crime! Do not worry, we will get to that. But first, let's establish how our wholesome blue man debut. X in his first game has a lot more going on than one would initially think. He has an intro saying he's special, an ending that goes into him hating to fight, which is something we will literally never hear the end of. Why must Reploids fight one another? I've had enough violence! and one single line of dialogue in his entire game. Oh, and there's a backstory in the manual if you ever bothered to read it, or if you even had it in the first place. X was mostly used as an avatar for the player, which was a narrative standard for those games back then. But X worked well with this minimalist approach, because the game itself defined a clear goal at the very beginning. Become strong enough to defeat Vile, and with Zero's dying breath, defeat Sigma. If you as a player are invested in what the game presents, these story beats hit pretty hard and further motivate you to complete the game. With all this information just from the first game alone, we can build a list of personality traits for X. Starting with the intro, we know X is a special robot with true free will. We also learn from this fight with Vile that he's very critical of himself, but is also driven to use his power to help others. We learn from Zero's death that he's a very caring person. After all, it's Zero's death that empowers him to defeat Vile. We learn from the ending that X is very idealistic and a pacifist at heart, but resorts to force when necessary and all he wants is peace for all beings of the planet. And if we bother with the manual, we finally learn that X is heroic with a sense of personal justice, as he volunteered to help the Maverick Hunters when Sigma and his team defected. These are defined traits that are easily observed while playing the game. In fact, outside media would take these traits and run with it. The Rockman manga and the Rockman novel does a pretty impressive job of growing X into his character. Archie Comics in particular did a wonderful job interpreting X, and even Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite would do just enough in making an accurate depiction. There are some misses though, the Ruby Spears cartoon turning X into a hulking death machine, and the Brazilian comment that goes absolutely wild with X, like, wow, X is one horny guy in that comic. Point being, X1 is X's coming of age story. It defines who he is, and he grows naturally into his role as a hero. But the crutch of being an avatar for the player had to go. After all, if you're like me, and X3 was your first Mech Man game, you're not exactly at a good starting point. No, oh, am I dead? Wait, is this girl the main character now? Man, look at how far, the other guy was a- This change came with some pitfalls. With X as a full character, writers weren't worried with trying to sell him. He's like Rock, the hero who will always do the right thing, and going by their writing, that's all they thought they needed to do with him. If you're a writer, then you're probably familiar with the hero's journey. While I do believe this is overused as a template, it's used to great success in X1. Now, I'm going to simplify this for the sake of time. Within the hero's journey is three acts. The departure, where the hero leaves the comfort of his own world. The initiation, where the hero goes into many trials to be reborn as a true champion. And lastly, the return, where the hero returns in triumph. 
there are many substages within these acts that X1 use, and trust me, it uses it well. But the fatal flaw with the hero's journey is that there is a clear ending. Once your hero returns triumphant, their journey is over. Sure, the hero can be used in sequels, but they're already a transformed character. So in order for them to go on another journey, they had to be initiated to transform again. And this is the problem that goes all the way from X2 to X5. X is never prompted to change or even have his values challenged. X2 and X3 doesn't even bother trying. X4 tries to be compelling but ultimately falls flat on his face. And X5 makes an effort, but there is an intense lack of setup throughout the story, which suddenly triggers a payoff that either makes no sense or makes too much sense. Uh, actually, like is X5 does have setup. It's been foreshadowed ever since X2 when Sigma tells Zero that he must serve him. In X3 when the narrator says X and Zero will have to fight. And X4 when Zero learns he used to be a maverick. <laughs> you are right. It has been foreshadowed. But that is not set up. While there is overlap and writers sometimes use them interchangeably, they are not the same. It'd be like if in Sonic Adventure 2, after Sonic and Shadow fight on Prison Island, a narrator starts talking and says, The two rivals have finished their fight, but one day they will team up! Just because you are told something will happen, doesn't mean the payoff will make sense. You can say foreshadowing is telling the audience that something is going to happen, while setup is the how and why something happens. There hasn't been a single time where it's been set up prior to X5 that X and Zero would fight for the fate of the world. Yes, Sigma drops a clue in X2, but that's all. It's so badly set up that X isn't even clued in on what's going on until the climax of X5. And while X doesn't need to have suspicions about the eventual showdown, his story does need to be pulled towards that direction. Again, this never happens. Now, X5 does try to do an, an immense amount of heavy lifting to steer X's story onto a full course collision into Zero's. They anticipate their friendship to near ham-fisted levels, and the plot ensures that no matter what character you play, they're both involved with each other's story. This, however, leaves an incredibly poorly written portion of the main plot, which unfortunately affects the good ending. For the uninitiated, Zero doesn't become evil in the good ending, but due to the intense foreshadowing of the previous games, the writers still have to fulfill the promise of providing a fight between X and Zero. This is an example of bad setup, and it forced X to be pretty out of character for this to work. I do trust you, Zero, and that's why I must take you back by force. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, there's the virus readings on Zero, but he also just doesn't seem to care. And worst of all, the fight itself doesn't have a consequence. X and Zero just move on to the final stage and continue the story. Now, if you go to the bad ending, everything makes sense. Zero is the origin point of the virus, he goes completely evil, and his goal is to destroy X. X, who values his friendship with Zero above all else, is finally challenged and called to action. But remember when I said it makes too much sense? I'll explain that now. You know how people hate Amy Rose for not having a character beyond Sonic's fangirl slash stalker? You know how people say if Sonic was gone, Amy would have no character? Well, replace Amy with X and Sonic with Zero. X's character growth is completely dependent on Zero. Wanna know how I realized that? X was screaming, Zero! at the top of his lungs when he was in the shuttle. And if the shuttle failed, X would scream about not leaving Zero! because he is not just his best friend, but his only friend. <laughs> yeah, screw Dr. King, screw Alias, screw Cygnus, screw Douglas. Just bend over and start sucking. <gasps> okay, stop. 
it's not quite time to unleash that charge shot just yet. So, Sigma unironically saves his debacle for X. He pretty much states he did all this with the sole intent of killing X, but is actually highly impressed that he fought Zero with no hesitation. He even says, you show no mercy for your enemies or comrades, and goes further to say he is the strongest Reploid. Contrast this with his dialogue with Zero, where he says Zero is the best, but Bet tracks and wonders if he actually is stronger than X. And don't worry, I checked the Japanese version and it basically says the same thing, for once. So despite his pacifist mentality, the highlight of X's character in X5 is his ruthlessness in combat. Though, again, this only really hits home in the bad ending, since in the good ending, Zero doesn't actually die due to his fight with X. Starting to really think this good ending was an afterthought here. Either way, the good ending has X carry on the fight in Zero's memory, with a ton more conviction, and the bad ending has X lose and reject any memory of Zero due to the intense pain he feels from it. Ed makes a goal to build a new utopia for humans and reploids alike, called Elysium. Both of these endings are bad in their own way, but I'll explain them just a bit because goddammit, I just want to get to X6. Like yeah, yeah, bad gameplay, not pussy made, yada yada yada, I don't care. X6 puts some honest-to-god character development into X. After four games of duds, X finally gets focused. So you can see why I really want to get into this, because there is a lot to talk about. X6 is a direct sequel to X5 and deals with the aftermath of the colony crash, and solidifies that the good ending route was chosen. But instead of three years into the future, it's three weeks. This is good. Three years is a lot of time to gloss over, and considering what little was done with X in X5, giving us some substance with an aftermath story was a great idea. Next, I'm jumping ahead some, but X's desire to build a utopia was taken from the bad ending and put into X6, and I love it. Okay, now this goes into why the X5 endings are bad. Let's start with the good ending. I already mentioned how a three-year time skip is a lot of time to gloss over. But the big reason this doesn't work is that it doesn't do anything for X at all. He doesn't really change or go through some revelation. He just becomes a more determined version of himself. Now, the bad ending is actually more egregious because it actually develops X a lot, but it leaves Implications. He wants to build a utopia for humans and reploids, and this is a good goal. But it implies that he only has that goal because he loses his memory of Zero. So the big difference between the good ending and the bad ending is whether X can handle the loss of Zero or not. If he handles it well, he moves on and doesn't change. If he can't, he develops and gains the ambition to make his dream into reality. The bad ending implies X believes the world must be chained, while the good ending implies X believes the world is good as it is. And this begs the question, why do these endings hinge upon X remembering zero or not? That is not correlation, that's actual causation. That means these two mindsets must be mutually exclusive from one another. In fact, the bad ending may even be better than a good ending for X, despite the dialogue and tone of the scene telling you that it's not. But let me just cut the crap and address the elephant in the room. The X endings are not about X himself. It's about Zero. Zero either dies a hero or dies a villain, and that is what affects X. Even in the damn endings, he has no agency at X5. Luckily, someone actually looked at X and realized the complete garbage development he's had to deal with. 
and instead it combined both positive aspects of X5's good endings and bad endings, with the good ending emboldening X's positive traits, with the bad ending giving X a true, tangible goal to creating a peaceful world. Let me make this clear, X did not have a personal goal prior to X6. This is the first time in the series where X gains the true desire to change the world, and this redefines him going forward. They don't talk about it much, but this goal is actually the central conflict between X and Gate. While X believes both humans and replays need to coexist for true peace, Gate believes the weak should fall in line to the strong, and that belief includes both humans and replays. This isn't like Sigma where he just wants to wipe out all humans for evolution's sake. Gate wants to rule the world with an iron fist. X represents compassion, while Gate represents strength. In fact, Gate actually admires X because he believes he is the strongest Ripley to have ever lived. And he mainly attributes that to X's specs and no one being able to analyze him. This is what drives Gate in the first place to push his creation to the absolute limit and make them unanalyzable. But of course, we all know X's strength comes from his emotions and compassion for others. And it's not something Gate can fully grasp, especially after he became infected with the Sigma virus. Their dialogue is actually really good, granted you're playing with a translation patch. And the way X and Gate bounce off each other is a lot of fun, because while Gate is ultimately an extremist, there is truth to his actions. The humans have done jack shit in the X series, and the Red Boys have done practically everything, including fighting the war that is about them. We don't even see them with the exception of Dr. Kane, who disappeared at the X3 anyway. So in Gates' case, he's absolutely right when he says all humans ever do is hide and cower. And if you add on the fact that Ripple Force push for independence was because they were wrongly mislabeled by the human government, you do start to wonder if protecting humanity would actually be worth it. Especially without evidence to the contrary. But X and Company doesn't get that a thought. They're all devoted to the belief that humanity and replays need each other. And ultimately, that's why X remains unfazed against attitude. You see why I say X6 is really good to X? It even recontextualizes the previous game. After being betrayed by Mac and Double, but of course more of the great actions, and most importantly, Zero's death, X becomes more jaded over the years, but his goals have become more determined than ever before. He hasn't lost anything about his character, but the parties have shifted. But wait, that's not all. Even the main theme of the Japanese opening, Moonlight, is a perfect encapsulation of X's state of mind for this game. And to those that wonder why I'm looking to a song, the fact is, the Japanese series has started using lyrical songs in their openings and endings ever since X4, and all the way to X8, and they often describe the theme of the game. Also, it's pretty much standard for singers and idols to also voice act and make songs about the titles they're in. In X6's case, the singer and artist of the main theme, Shotaro Morikubo, was also the voice actor of X and has been since X5. So there's pretty clear evidence behind the intent of this title song. The overall theme of the song is Perseverance. While I'll avoid going too deep into it, the biggest takeaway is that the song metaphorically talks about the sunlight and moonlight and how they both drive X forward. Within the song, X has lost the sunlight and is relying on the moonlight. While it's easy to assume the sun is zero and the moon is a saber, the lyrics are significantly more personal than that. I'll provide the very first verse of the song for emphasis. Within the context of the song, I would propose the sun is X's pacifist ideology, and the moon is X's sense of duty as a maverick hunter and protector of the world. 
In short, through everything he's been through, Axe's ideology has been damaged, but he pushes forward despite that, because the world deserves to be protected. And this shows very clearly within the game itself. X is significantly more aggressive than he's ever been. He still hates senseless war, but there's not one time in a game he laments it. When Cygnus asks if X will go out and fight, X immediately says he'll do it. No hesitation. He says to Nightmare Zero he's going to beat his face in. He says all Dynamo is good for is running away. He doesn't even care in the slightest about High Max's strength, and he wants to curse stomp Isaac really badly. He even tells Sigma, who doesn't even need to be in his game to be honest, that he's wasting his time and he'll kill Sigma again if he comes back. But as aggressive as, as that all is, X is still sympathetic if not empathetic to most of the Maverick, often giving them the opportunity to just surrender. But with exception to Rain Turnoid, the inevitability of fighting doesn't hurt him. Then we finally have the matter with Gate and Elia, where X declares he'll stop Gate's hatred from killing any more Reploids. And while he does end up killing Gate, he preserves his body because he was Elia's friend. This, in turn, pushes Elia to dedicate herself to X's dream to create his ideal utopia. I'm very impressed with how much X6 does for X. Ah, that felt good. As much flack as X6 gets, I really do appreciate it as a game that actually has X as a main. Wait. Why? Why'd you revive Zero? He has his own fucking 